Welcome back, my friends, to TNO. I'm your host, Kim Lover, Mocha Lover. So, right now, we have a toast. Rurg's banquet hall filled with food and laughter as he and his new aristocrats celebrated the victory over the traitors and the implementation of a better Siberia. Hey, Rurg, pass the butter, will you? As one of the rather large men began to drink his fourth glass of vodka. Rurik smiled and reached for the butter when he was interrupted by an older aristocrat. Sergey, you never talk to your tsar like that. Where are your manners? It's quite fine, Nikolai. Now, I quite enjoy the pleasantries rather than anything more formal, responded Rurik. A Rurik. As you say, Tsar Rurik II, by the grace of God, of conquered Almighty, I humble in your presence, said an old aristocrat, now bowing. <laughs> Rurik paused, but he was distracted by yet another young aristocrat. You're as good as putting on a banquet as you are ruling kingdom, he said. You even get your children to stop arguing. Well, I always know when a good time... No when is, when is a good time to celebrate, and so do my children, Rook replied. He knew that he would be facing more challenges soon, but it was about time he enjoyed the pleasant atmospheres of Kemerovo himself. Without him, none of that would exist. After all, that's to see something of the incident. And, a call for uprising, comrades. Unlike the a-holes that run Siberia, I will not lie to you. The truth is so simple. So simple. I don't need any fancy language to explain it to you. It is the truth that any Russian child knows. There's something wrong with those that lead. You all know the kind of men I'm talking about. Those that promise safety, promise prosperity, and promise ah. What do they not promise? They've been doing it since even before the great patriotic war. When a country lies in ruin and our people scrounge in the dirt, what action do our leaders take? They promise. I, for one, am sick of the promises, sick of the lies, sick of the barbarism. So, here right now. Right now, I'm going to be honest with you. I am not your leader, and I never intend to be. I am simply a man as you are who wishes for the cruelty to stop. We have an opportunity now to forge a new Russia, one where each man is truly equal. With one without leaders, to get it, we will have to fight. However... The men of Central Siberia have nothing to lose. If it is we who keep producing, flowing, or production flowing, us who ensures their bullets, bread, and steel arrive on time. In the name of all the dead children, all the widows, and all the crippled sons, to heck with their promises. Can you all just calm down? Nope. And, well, apparently Tomsk is now demilitarized, which is not good, but actually, that could be a lot worse. It could be just like Kemerovo itself, which would be quite bad, or even Krasnoyarsk, because that's pretty central. So if it, they're all contained on this one side here. I'm okay with that. And they might be angry at it, you, at us, just because, you know, they might have a little bit of discontent here and there. It is what it is, but happy 1965, everyone. Hope you're having a great year. Currently, we, are, we have a couple of comments to go through. The shield's been broken. It's January. We're doing or finishing up a new capital, but the revolt of Tomsk. Dire news has been received by the city of Tomsk before the fires of revolution now reside in the city. Following the innumerable days of needless strikes, the discontent strikers appear to have abandoned any hopes for a peaceful resolution and have taken to the streets with arms stolen from the local armory. Worse still, with support moderately widespread, some outlying territories surrounding Tomsk have also risen up in solidarity with a few of the intellectuals in the city even itself, joining the revolt, being up with arms with the actions of our new state. For the future of a new nation at a precipice, many are also beginning to question the effectiveness of our rule. If this so-called workers' revolt is not quelled, it would only mean disaster for a new state. Revolution has painted the city of intellectuals. A coat of red. Oh, boy. Well, no, this is not too bad. We shall deal with them the way we must, and they're led by Mr. Smiley Man, Vitaly Kostin. Now, I wouldn't mind playing as him. Oh, but he's a, he has a unique focus tree. That's kind of cool. Let's take a look at how strong he is first. Just because we whip you a lot doesn't mean you have to rebel. Alright, well, just go on ahead, guys. See what you can do about that. Um, I'm going to have you guys go that way, actually. That's a little laggy. Oh, boy. You just guys keep these guys in place. Actually, do that. And circle and destroy them, please. That'd be nice. Uh, both of you come here. I oh, will just encircle and destroy them like this. Yeah, that'd be nice. Come on, go, 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 go. Oh, they're going to get a lot of places in the north. As long as they don't lose camera rubble, that's the main, that's the main thing. And, come on, good, good, good. Quite a bit of lag. Uh, let's see, so, I mean, like I said in the last episode, they can only do one path at a time, and unfortunately, uh, for some, we are still going to go down the princess route. I will play as Rook again, I promise, someday, in which we will do the prince path, because he sounds like a lot of fun as well, so... I promise we will play them someday. I'm not sure when, but definitely someday. Just take back Tom's, because you might just be able to beat them all up like that. Cool. Minus 21% stability. All right. And what do we have down here? Higher foreign instructors? You bet we will. I love it. And then we shall continue with monuments to our victories. When the Tsar still ruled Russia, they erected many memorials to celebrate great feats. These statues of warriors, emperors, thinkers, and workers, they ensure the eternity of our nations. However, with the coming of the treacherous Hun and Japanese, old monuments have been lost, demolished, and desecrated. Fortunately, there is no shortage of epics in Siberia. Recent tales of courage in the Tsar's might. 
Plans are being already being laid. Statues of Rook II will observe the kingdom from mountaintops. City centers will be decorated with shrines to the bravest of the king's guard. Every factory shall have a monument to inspire its workers. Centuries later, when Russia has climbed out of the grave, our children will look back and marvel at the victories we have won here today. Great, you get more war support, even though we really don't need it. I prefer more um, stability, honestly, if that was me, but... Not bad. A new capital? Well, I want to get Tomsk done first. Actually, no, it won't even matter. The situation has changed dramatically from the grim hours we have endured a few years ago. With the victory of His Majesty's armed forces and the expansion of the realm's borders to encompass the entire central Siberian region, the question has been raised of where exactly the royal court should be located. Kamarov was never intended to be the permanent center of royal authority and was mostly chosen simply because it was the only noteworthy settlement available to us. Now that the region has been united, we now have a few locations that could possibly be more suitable to, as the administrative center of the realm. Novosibirsk is the most obvious choice, being the largest and most popular city of all Siberia. On top of being a vital industrial center, the city of Benefits from a well-developed infrastructure and a strong agricultural base. Alternatively, we can move the court to the city of Krasnoyarsk, formerly controlled by Nikolai Andreev and his mutineers. While well, not necessarily as populous as Novosibirsk, Krasnoyarsk is still quite large by Siberian standards, and most importantly of all, is home to a critical junction of the Trans-Siberian Railway. This fact alone makes the city appealing choice indeed. Of course, we could always decide to just stay in Kemerovo. Of all the potential choices, Kemerovo is the most centrally located, and benefits from having developed into a stronghold of royal authority for many years. Of course, there is also the uh, Sentimental value. Kemerovo is where our kingdom was proclaimed in the first place, after all. Uh, because we're going down Lydia, and she's more militaristic, to me, that means we want as much industry as possible. So I'm going to go to Novosibirsk for this one. So, Oh, we get more stability, but Novosibirsk for now. Cool. Oh, Omsk is there. Well, with what always happens in every campaign... Actually, I'm going to separate you guys out, maybe... Yeah, we'll wait. Once we get more soldiers. Uh, we want to eventually fight the other directions, so we have to go east first, which shouldn't be... Honestly, too difficult for us. So, uh, build, 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 build. I don't care. Build. I don't care how bad the infrastructure is. Just build. Build more, 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 more. Cool. Thank you very much. And then we'll do affairs of the realms. With this position finally secure, the principality looks inward or must look inward. Laws need to be expanded to fit a larger population, bureaucrats recruited to administer the new provinces, and officers promoted to protect the borders. So our work himself will oversee the creation of new legislation and place the royal seal upon the most pragmatic proposals. The aristocracy will be given permission to draft lo unique laws to their own fights, but ultimately everyone must answer to the Zimsky Sobor. Zimsky Sobor. Lastly, an important issue needs to be considered. Siberia is a large and unforgiving place, so infrastructure is key to reclaiming the rest of the Rus'. Local enterprise will be subsidized to promote the development of roads and communication networks if the kingdom is to succeed. It will need to be able to draw upon the land, ensure that all of its laws are heard by all. Nice. Wow. We're moving pretty darn quickly doing all this stuff. Uh, do these guys first. It just makes more sense probably that way. We still have a lot of debt, but not where we're headed. So, there you go. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Uh, I love 40 combo with infantry. Anything else we can throw in here just yet? How much, how much support equipment do we have? We got plenty of guns, not enough support equipment, really. We're not even making any, really. Ooh, that's not bueno. Yeah, go and do. Keep yourselves on three for now. Oh, look at that lag. Why is it lagging so hard? I don't know. It's doing anything in the background, huh? Uh, just do five and then five. Monument to our victories is very nice. And then affairs of the realm, my friends. Affairs of the realm. Let's come back over here. No, come back over here. Uh, just do five and five. I think five for all would be pretty okay. Delvanga Brigade? Cool. Top for coffee, though. Reduces administrative strain on your budget. I would love that so much. Increases consumer goods factors by 5%. Oh, look upon my works. Staying at least 6 meters tall, including the pedestal, the huge statue is something to behold of. Made of the finest stone and granite, Siberia, Uruk was rather flattered. The armor was quite detailed, using every accuracy of the medieval era. It even included a few jewels and diamonds and placed carefully into the armor. Uruk was quite sure it would become a staple piece of Novus Abyss for years to come. Of course, the sculptor clearly took some artistic liberties. Uruk would often quite not go into battle carrying a sword while also riding a horse, no matter how much he wanted to. He was also not as quite as muscular as he was in the sculpture, but still, Uruk was quite pleased. He quite liked it how it was overly romanticized and he had to make sure the sculptor was well paid for his work. And if this was enough to be put up just for the unification of Central Siberia, he couldn't dream of what would be put up in his honor once Moscow's back in Russia's grasp. Quite impressive. Administering the kingdom. State controlled unions with non socialist unions allowed. Poverty and industrial expertise goes up. Or we go with this one. Loyal boyars. Industrial equipment. Uh let's see. Reduces the administrative strain on the government. But more cost. Daily political power gain is not bad. Promote new culture. Uh, building slots. Uh, medium taxation. 
So we lose political power. Low income weighted. I like more money. Well, mm, I'll probably go with this one next. Administering the kingdom. With the acquisition of the new lands, King Rurik II has proclaimed the Royal Ministry of Internal Affairs modeled after pre-war institutions. The organization's objective will be to integrate existing institutions, foster economic development, and reconstruction efforts, and ensure a smoother bureaucracy. Naturally, both Yuri and Lydia will also try to compete for the control over the ministry, so the, tar the Tsar will have to decide upon which favor, which child of his to favor. Very good. Uh, there was one comment saying that someone would have liked to see there's like a third path, because, you know, there's Lydia, there's Yuri, and then there's Boris. It'd be cool if kind of Boris had his own path or something like that, or, you know, um, for, maybe for more options for him to do things. I think that'd be... A Kind of cool as well. I love having more options, so. Yes. Yes. Reduce that administrative strain, because I hate administrative strain. Huh. Terrible. And we only get points of one. That's still not bad. A minor issue. Another day, another heated argument in the Zemsky support. What was thought one side to be a minor issue had escalated to become another verbal battlefield for the two wolves, Princess Yuri, Prince Yuri and Princess Lydia, to do battle on. To intrude upon the rights of local councils would be tantamount to tyranny, no matter how small the intrusion. Yesterday, it may only be the roads and telephone lines, but what about tomorrow? I wholeheartedly agree that the realm must be connected, but we, we cannot do it without the express consent of the people. As always, Yuri was not, if nothing if not passionate. His sister Lydia rolled her eyes again with a talk of rights, Yuri. How tiresome. Perhaps you should also like us to ask the, ask the ground if it would be okay for us to build on top of it. Maybe we should ensure that the God-given rights of the woodland animals aren't infringed upon either. Laughter could be heard amongst some of the council in response. Eurorick II was distraught at the sight of his children arguing with each other in such a way, but he did his level best not to show it. It was clear, however, that the two would not budge. Soon enough, the council would be looking to the king to break the deadlock. Princess Lydia, unfortunately, has a point to the detriment of Prince Yuri. It is what it is. And, man, this is quite a bit laggy. Or maybe just normal, you know, and I'm just, like, mentally just gone. It could be that, too. It could be that, too. Royal edicts. We gotta lower the administrative strain here, so no matter what happens, where are you? Well, there's that one down there. Oh, so, bureaucrats, if you like to read about this one, please go right ahead. I, I like that one, because it does give us more change, but we gotta promote loyal bogiars, so this way we can get to assemble a new that guy? Actually, huh. Um, yeah, both of these do the same thing. Uh, if we have to, we already have over 100%. This is why I went over 100%. Consumer goods, just in case things like this happen. Like, you get 5% more. So we'll still have 102% once we're done. But the workers' revolt has left its marks on the realm. It's clear that there still exists a deep sympathy for the red cause amongst her people. Doubtless, every factory has its agitator who reminds the workers of the failed union. Every village has its veteran who weaves tales of glory on the WRRF. Every city has its anarchist who moves the people with false promises of freedom. No matter, the king is a plan. Every revolt has a spark. Be it an unpopular war or unfair treatment by the government. To ensure the safety of the kingdom, propaganda will spread messages to calm the people. We will soon or assure the border towns of their safety and the workers will be guarded at fair wage. The army's loyalty will be checked by the soldier. Russia cannot survive in yet another revolution. We must guard against a tide of communism. Very good. Very good. And next up, uh, what do we want to do here? I'm not really sure. But we do want to do one of these, so that's definitely what we want to do. I might want to get more stability. Equipment is so good to get, though. Good. So good to get. So we'll go with equipment. I want to do all of them eventually, so we'll see what happens. But administering the kingdom. Administrative grumbles. Or grumbling, some might say. The non-royal members of the Zemsky Sobor knew the moment they entered the chamber that there would be yet another showdown between Princess Lydia and her brother. The glow glowering, venomous looks as she shot across the floor were potent enough. They were not disappointed. The item on the agenda concerned the recruitment restrictions and desired qualifications for state bureaucrats, primarily as it concerned the social status. True to his roots. Prince Yuri favored relaxing or even eliminating them altogether, both in order to promote social advancement as well as connect the ordinary people to the government in stronger fashion at that. But Lydia responded with her usual cutting, derisive laughter. The people she proclaimed were unreliable at best and insurrectionists at worst. Bureaucrats should be handpicked from the aristocracy, she argued, in order to both ensure that they owed their loyalty to the institutions of government and were unlikely to have sympathies with revolutionary elements. The debate continued as the most expected. You recalled a sister a tyrant and she called him a fool, with the epithets only escalating from there and those in attendance silently counting the minutes where they would once again be free, unwilling to place themselves in the line of fire. Th though all... Th including the royal siblings, knew that a decision would eventually be made by the father. Prince Yuri makes a good point. I'm sorry, Prince Yuri. You will have your time. I promise Prince Yuri will have his time, but today is just not his day. We need more GDP. 
more GDP, more, 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 more. And then, as much as I'd love to do this one, Ruskaya Pravda. We're going to go with the modern Oprichininya. Princess Lydia has proposed to revive the Oprichininya system, a stark comparison to her brother's Ruskaya Pravda. After during the 16th century, the system will be retooled in compliance with modern laws and systems. Proposed stipulations include, but not are limited to, the reorganization of police units into Oprichiniki, modeled after the Romanov Okarana, and the communist NKVD, but answerable to the king, a right to the limited free speech based on local laws, the right of the nobles and crown to lay or levy peasantry into wars, increased roles of the king's godsmen in prosecution and trial of the peasants and nobles, the right for the crown to govern resettlement of peasants, the right of Oprichinigna, China to units to search and arrest based on suspicion, the right to assembly permitted by the crown and nobles, and the affirmation of capital and corporal punishment in both military and civilian role. Now, I don't like getting more political power, or more, I love getting more political power, but I hate getting more cost, GDP cost. Oh, that's so not good. So not good. Wow. I was looking at that. It just, it just stopped at one for some reason. Hmm. I might just reload, reload the game if it's going to be like this, maybe. But we get more stability, which is nice. We get more political power, but... Civilian intelligence, civilian intelligence to others, not very bueno, but it, we do create a free intelligence agency. So we don't have to use civvies for that, as well as reduce administrative strain on the budget, which is super, super important, because now we're currently at 0.84, which is a little better, because administrative strain hurts us with minus 28% political power, which is just not very good. Not good at all. Nightingale, come again. Ever since Princess Lydia had been installed as the governor of Tomsk, the city's hospitals and healthcare infrastructure seen some much-needed attention. Not only has Princess Lydia raised funding for hospitals and modernized much of the previous infrastructure, but a mysterious woman has also appeared. This nameless woman has been aiding hospitals and tending to the wounded and sick on the streets at night. Many citizens of Tomsk attribute the feats of this woman to help to the kind actions of some good Samaritan, but in reality, this is simply not the case. The people of Tomsk do not see behind the curtain Lydia has established the team of paramedics, medical mercenaries, the patrolmen working in tandem to look at and treat those unable to reach hospitals. They do not see the many messages Lydia sends monitoring their progress and success, and instructing them on how to more efficiently perform their jobs. The people of Tomsk remain unaware of how much effort was needed to hide all this from their eyes, and all the interest in giving them their beloved heroine. Ooh, heroine! The mystery remains unsolved, and the people of Tomsk seem content to leave it that way. The belief creates the actual facts. Cool. And we have some more political power to go and do some more stuff down here. What do we want? Stability? Stability for the nation sounds really good, but agriculture development is pretty good. I like that too. Ooh. I love it's it is I have as much as I want to do equipment, I gotta do expertise because that bonus for industry is just too good to pass up, especially if we want to research things faster, faster, faster. So and as you can see, Erkutz isn't doing so great right now, but neither is Cheetah. Yeah, they got encircled twice. Oh boy, the divine man is severe. You did get the port, so they're do, kind of doing okay. Oh, a modern operation, yeah. Operation, op, op, But peace in the kingdom, shall we? For the first time in over half a century, there is some peace in Russia. It is finally beginning to dawn upon the peasants that they no longer have to be subjected to famine, and banditry, or looting by their own government. Women and children can safely travel between major cities. Bartering is gradually becoming displaced by imperial coins, and notorious bandit nests have been neutralized. The clouds feel less heavy, and workers can truly appreciate the morning breeze, confident that their workplace will spare their life and limbs. There's still the occasional complaint by some former priests, and every so often, a village is awoken by the screams of a socialist being dragged off to prison, but... The chaos that was the warlord period is over, and a new age is coming. And Pakistan becomes independent. Good job, Pakistan. Interesting. Vertical envelopment. We love it. Love it, love it, love it, love it. So we have one. We've got two. So we can save that for later. Let's really focus more on our industry. Civilian construction. Yes, please. The all-joking, all-drunken synod of fools and jesters. Oh, boy. Deep in the halls of conquerors, both... Past woodlands and farms, an emperor sat upon his steel throne. As the raging fires of hearth and spotlight shone upon the greater Tsar Rurik II, more so than the other squabblers and plotters throughout the vast Russian lands, Rurik II, known many moons ago as Marshal of a Greater Soviet Union bearing the name Nikolai Ivanovich Korolev, was born the name of conqueror past these frozen lands, allowing man, woman, and child to feast upon the glories and victories they have rightfully earned, just as Rurik intends to do so tonight. My lord, the guests have arrived," said the captain of the guards. The two Russian men bearing snow laden. Coats walked in. One bore a steely set of glasses and a sharp mustache and goatee, whilst the other cared for less appearances, bearing grisly scars across an equally grisly, unshaven face. The two Alexanders, greater than any other conqueror of the Greece, and greater friends than any Tsar may ask of, cried the Tsar as he hopped down his steps and embraced the two tightly in his warm coat. And thus, Tsar Rurik II was joined by Alexander Sevstov and Alexander Kar 
uh, Kazartsev. For a night of hearty laughter, belly warming drinks, and glorious stories, it was true each of these men had to be to think constantly each and every day, making plans centered around the very survival of the people, whilst the haunting poltergeists of a war long lost to go crept up on their shoulders, rousing them to an awakening each and every night as the screams of fallen comrades plagued them. But now was not such a night, no. Now was a night to long for one of laughing and loving friends. Oh, for the day where every Russian may do the same. Oh, let's hope so. Let's grab some more Max Factories in the state, too. And it, and then we'll just, just keep building. Just keep building, doing what we're doing. Because we're doing a pretty good job, I'd say so for now. Uh, if you're already that high, just keep going. Because New York, please, please, please. Three days left. And, of course, we got a few months left for this stuff. Mass production method's going to take some time. I think we're going to end up fighting men. It's going to be kind of a pain in the butt, but that's okay. And peace. More stability, which I love, 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 love. And more political power would be very, very good. Oh, we have the thing done nice. Very good. Now, I could invest more in this right now, but I think we're going to wait. I think that might just be for the best. Yeah, it's going to be a while for that. How is the budget looking? 4.2. Wow, that's a lot. But then again, we're making more and more divisions, so, I mean, it is what it is. At this point, we're going to just say one more, because now we're going to train these guys. Cool. Very nice, very nice. You can get that down, too. Uh, stability. Weekly stability. Get 10% 10, 10 more stability and a little bit more support. You know what? I'm going to go and choose that one. Just I love stability so much. So 35, I wonder what the hard cap is, because you see all those red and green numbers. There's a hard cap on what, how much you can get, depending on your modifiers. So I, I would really like to see what it, the hard cap is right now, but whatever. Uh, let's see, embrace, embrace modernity and tradition. Promote the new culture. Decadence is the bane of civilizations. As a nation grows strong, it loses the old ways, forgets its roots and ancestors. The seeds of Russia were once planted by Kiev and the Rus, a fading memory preserved only in libraries. King Rurik II wishes to remedy this disaster through the use of mass media and government contracts with manufacturers. The old will become new. If you'd like to read about industrial equipment, though, please go right ahead, because it happens every campaign. Architectural designs will try to mimic those of the medieval age. TVs will broadcast movies based on ancient epics. Folk music shall bloom to dominate the industry. Tales of old hags and three-headed dragons will enter kindergarten curriculums, and their noble houses will recover the flags of old. Officers shall be given ceremonial battle axes. Laws preserving the forest and hills be put into place. The new kingdom will emulate the old one, which will be uh, kind of a fun thing to do. We keep losing factories, though. We were at 60 and then 59, and now we're only 58. Kind of sucks. Kind of sucks. Yeah, I'm not really sure what's about this lab, though. Hmm. I got nothing else in the background. Still processing, so hmm, very odd. Uh, what is our equipment like right now? We need way more guns and artillery, but that's pretty normal. That's honestly pretty darn normal for us. All right, up next, agriculture is usually pretty good to do. But what do you have over here? Industrial equipment slowly gets improved, and we do get some more military factories, but it does hurt our civilian factories right now. I love the infrastructure, but that can wait. That can definitely wait. Construction speed is not bad. Academic base, agriculture. Yeah. Oh, I'm gonna do this too. Nice. Jelena Nebo Nebogatov, Ludmila Ostrovsky. Well, I like it's easier to say her last name, so we'll go with that one. And then embrace modernity and tradition. To the outside observer, the kingdom of Siberia, as a kingdom of contradictions, the banner of Kiev and the Rus is a colored red and yellow. Former red and white officers fight side by side in the name of the king. Nobles pass laws in favor of factory workers and participate in local elections, however. Through chaos, there is order. King Rurik II has achieved the unachievable. He has combined the best of both worlds. On one hand, the old communist regime's progress cult, militarism, and state atheism. On the other, the old kingdom's natural pride, loyalty, and a degree of capitalism. And although many question Rurik's unorthodox methods, many more labeled him a failure, the kingdom of Siberia now stands as a shining beacon of opportunity in the Siberian wastelands. What's not to love? But a family meeting. Prince Boris looked at his father with unease together. They devised this imminent meeting between his ever feuding siblings, but as the time it approached, he could not but feel apprehensive. Lydia was first to enter, early as usual, and wearing her practice expression of indulgent arrogance. He could tell that she had not believed that lie he had told to draw her here for an instant, but had had come nonetheless out of respect for her father. Yuri arrived later. Rurik quickly took control before they could begin sparring. <clears throat> He had asked Boris to set this up, he said, because he was tired, both personally and officially, of seeing his two more prominent children in constant and violent odds. It was bad for his health to continue, and that it was very bad for the stability of the state. Together with Boris, he, they, implored them to come to an understanding. The room was quiet for a long, long moment. Before Lydia laughed sharply and cruelly, in that moment, Boris knew they had failed. She did not have anything to... 
she did not have to do anything of the sort, she said coldly, as she had done nothing wrong. She had always acted in the best interest of the state, and Yuri needed to accept that. Yuri immediately retorted they had always acted in the interest of the people, and she could not see that a state without its people was nothing, and she did, she did not deserve her position. The war of words continued as Boris looked desperately at her father, who only shook his head, another failure. Shortly thereafter, Lydia declared the entire affair a waste of time, and stood... Uh, or probably stood up. Yuri did the same, and one of the few things he said that he could agree with her upon. They both stormed out a moment later. Boris and Yurik exchanged a sigh. What else could they do? Could have had, could it have it ended any other way? Maybe, but not today. And we just want to embrace modernity and tradition, and not monk. Cool. Just watch. Oh, there goes Cheetah. Erkutsk versus Divine Man of Siberia. Uh, as, long as, they, as long as they both have no manpower, I'm kind of okay with it. We actually kind of like these guys a little bit. Look at that. Oh, he had no map power, so man is going to be winning here, probably. How many divisions do they have? But when we face him, we're just going to have 40 combat with infantry, so that's the main goal. Definitely the main goal. How is the West looking right now? It looks like the WRF has done very, very well. Unfortunately, Samara is probably going to die. Omsk is doing okay, but we'll have to wait and see what, they, what they're up to, so. I think up next we shall choose... Uh, academic base. Yeah, why not? Cool. Rurikid fashion, shall we? Oleg clocked out of the Novosibirsk factory and prepared to head home. Oh, look at that. Very cool. Donning his old coat and eager to find out what his wife had prepared for dinner. Picking up some bread from the bakery, Oleg noticed some of the other customers more interested, more interesting clothing. Women in colorful dresses and tops, men with large fuzzy hats and red, dark red coats, with detailed patterns covering them from head to toe. It almost looked medieval, thought Oleg. Had everyone decided to copy that mad Tsar? People these days were so eager to latch onto others' fashion. Purchasing the bread, he even noticed the store owner, Nikita, was wearing a large blue medieval-looking robe and sporting a long beard outside it. Even you, Nikita, I thought you were a diehard Republican, spotted Oleg, surprising to see him even wearing the Tsar style. Ah, but the times are changing, replied Nikita. I've learned Rurik's a great Tsar better than any present could be. Besides, these things are comfy. I've heard this one's called a Fajaz. There's a store selling them right across the street. No thanks, I'll stick with the more modern clothing, replied Oleg as he left the store. Finally arriving home, his wife was the first thing he saw as he walked through the door. Helena, what are you wearing? said Oleg incredulously. It's my new fur coat. All the women are wearing it. Noble women used to wear these things back in ancient Russia. That's getting kind of weird. Uh, the colors are just gorgeous. I think I'll keep it forever. Helena said, smiling. Oleg stammered, not knowing what to say. His wife, wearing insane clothing as well. Everyone was wearing something from the medieval age. Honey, what's wrong? said Helena. Helena. H Helena. Yeah, Helena. You know what? You really need a new coat. Did you see the place near the bakery? It is a very good selection of men's clothing. Let's take you there tomorrow. We can get some for the kids as well. It'll be perfect. Well, maybe I should get with the times. No research facilities. Oh, God, this is... Oh, I'm enjoying this. But Royal Edicts... Uh, let's see. I would like to reduce the administrative strain some more. Look at that lag. Oh, it's, oh so not bueno. I keep saying that, but my goodness. I'm going crazy. Royal Edicts. Decades of poor leadership have left Russia in a sorry state. Contradicting laws, excessive bureaucracy, not to mention the ineptitude of the warlords, have all played their part in confusing the new government. Nevertheless, King Rurik II is no stranger to monumental tasks and wishes to draft royal edicts. These laws will allow for an overhaul of the central bureaucracy, streamlining of Siberian administration, and hopefully pave the way for a new Russian Empire. Oh, let's hope so. Oh, we want a new Russian Empire. Yes, please. Um, we could do that. Oh, we're good at resources, too. Let's go with this one, then. More factory output would be quite nice, because we do need to get some more guns and such, and just equipment, period. Yeah, definitely more guns. Just more things in, just in general. But hey, one, two, not bad. I feel like we're, we're lacking here just a little bit. We're still at only minus 77% of consumer goods in factories, which is not good. Obviously, it's not good. That's what your kingdom, new hierarchy, militarist king. Take our primacy, Krasnodarsk Railway Junction, Kuznets Basin, Novosibirsk Aircraft Plant, Legacy. Oh, okay, that'll be removed eventually in 1966, which is pretty good. February, we'll get more resource efficiency gain, which even though we're good on resources, consumer goods factories, construction speed, factory output, that's probably what's really hurting us right now. And overextended administration is obviously very, very bad as well. So, but we're working on it. We're working on it, my friends. Royal Edicts. I love it. Look at all the political power we have. We can only get how much every day? Uh, lag. We currently get 1.19. Man, you don't see it, but like I keep seeing the, the blue spinning wheel of uh, you know Windows when it lags this when it lags hard. So which is not very good. 
I might just save it for military industrial development, because I still want better industrial equipment. But the Tsar's new armor. To many in the crowd, the marvel on stage was something almost out of an old story book. A Tsar in glistening iron armor, his sword sheath, but always at the ready for battle. And the most important piece of the collection, the cape with the crest of the royal family. But for some of the crowd, the appearance of modern day rifles, men in old military fatigues, clashed with the appearance of the great man as he led them in marching formation. The vast majority, however, didn't notice did not notice any incongruity with the current reality they had been living in. The armor had been the talk of Novosibirsk. Ever since Tsar Rurik II had been seen protected by his royal guard at the local blacksmith, all citizens of the Tsar Dumas speculated especially made armor for the le for the leader to ride off into battle on horseback, but no one had expected it to be so authentically traditional. As he strode through the street, his men in the tanks at his back, there came a moment where he stopped. He signaled to his men, and they in confusion did as they were told. The Tsar, mumbling something under his breath, called for the horse, and as a whole crowd of soul subjects watched him worry, rode away without further explanation. The day afterwards, the Tsar gave a decree that had almost a mystical experience, and wished it to be left alone, as he needed time to understand and contemplate the reason for my feelings that day. The armor was never seen again. <laughs> Perhaps he wasn't feeling well? Actually, that's really cool. Coat of arms? My family actually does have a coat of arms, but uh, I can't share that, because that would literally dox me, probably, but yeah, coat of arms are pretty awesome. I love it. Ah, royal edicts. Why did it take so long to make? Ah, Why? But yeah, this is, is going to be quite a few months. How is the GDP doing? Is there still, it's still over 4 billion, which is not good. But hey, 5.7 billion, not bad. Which means we should get poverty stuff, hopefully relatively soon. Construction. Um, we can invest in all this stuff later on. Infrastructure, I love that. More oil, I love oil. Was that aluminum or tung tungsten? And resource efficiency again. That's just not worth it. Actually, this one's... Uh, we lose stability, but we can make that up pretty easily. You get more worse, but which we could actually use. Uh, but you get more weekly manpower, which isn't very much, but more consumer goods. I think for us, it really doesn't matter too much for the consumer goods since we're already minus, what, 77% or whatever. So, it is what it is. But I really want to unify with the East because we get more factories. And we need more factories. Let's be real. How's, how's the world looking? LBJ is president of the United States. So, good old LBJ, who I still need to play as at the time of this recording. But, Union of South Africa. Did they already have a second civil war? I thought they already did. Oh, South Africa. Oh, this is disgusting. Gross Afrikaner Show Reichstadt, you own this, but you're not even connected, which is kind of disgusting, but whatever. Repurpose the monastery, shall we? King Rick has always had an odd relationship with the Orthodox Church, a proud atheist. He has denounced the priests as charlatans and wizards of blight upon Russia, not unlike opium. Although a sizable faction within the civil war calls for the complete destruction of all churches, temples, and organizations that undermines the king's authority, certain nobles advocate for a more practical option, repurposing the buildings for more useful tasks. Namely, border churches will be militarized and converted into barracks. The basements turn into arsenals, thereby making the building a village blockhouse. Temples within the safety of the kingdom can become prisons for the unending stream of criminals, too. Hey. Everything's got a use, right? Uh, that's not bad. Yep, nothing else. Uh, anything else? Reunification of Russia? Nope. The Royal Court? Oh, Afghanistan and Pakistan killing each other? Sounds good to me. And technology will be done in quite a few months. So, the purpose, the king of the people. A lot can be said about the Romanovs of yesteryear, that they were weak and decisive, maybe even the biggest factor that led to the failure of the Russian state. However, by far the biggest failure had been the inability to connect with their own people. King Rurik, himself having been a common man, understands the complexities of the modern age. The peasantry are no longer illiterate masses with minimal power, but potent tools for change. King Rurik wishes to establish minor welfare programs, encouraging his nobles to interact with civilian governments, guarantee property and safety rights, among other things. Much of Russia is still in disrepair. It is critical that the people of the land and know whose side they are on. And reduce administrative strain. Good, good, good. The Clash of the Wolves. What is this? The king's children have been at with each other for years. Now they prepare a final clash to determine who succeeds their father on the throne. Which sounds like we're going to disappoint some people. Oh, the spirit of the Rus reborn. Oh, that's kind of cool. You get a lot more political power. Man, they just gave you so much pee, -pee here. So much pee, -pee. Uh, As much as I want more weekly manpower. Look at that stability. That's looking pretty good now. As much as I love more consumer goods, we really don't need it. As much as I want to do this one, we're probably going to invest in construction. It's not that much more political power. It's only 100 more million to the debt, but getting more construction speed to help make up for the penalty that we have from workers striking and stuff will help us out quite a bit more. So, and we just want to build. Like, I just want to build, 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 build. And the king of the people. Yes, yes, yes. And we'll follow up with. Install... Yes. Oh, I showed this one earlier. Install regional Posadniks. It is a grim truth that we simply have too much land and too few nobles. Although the aristocracy is able to govern population centers and production capitals, they're not quite enough for the smaller villages, which now constitute the larger part of our new kingdom. King Rurik II has decided to reinstall the old Posadnik uh, system. Absent in Russia for more than 500 years, these bureaucrats will rule eastern towns, help assimilate local populace, and can be granted temporary leadership by nobles. These administrators will answer directly to the king, but elected from existing minor nobles or exemplary officers, which is a good thing. 
changing the decor. Uh, let's see anything else here yet. Nope. Cool. Uh, Father Kirill watched silently as his heart heavy as the soldiers moved to pack his icons, Bibles, and other priestly items in the boxes present. It should have been requisitioned by the Royal Army for use as a command post and had been made very clear as politely as possible that he had no choice in the matter. The common soldiers themselves have been very respectful. <clears throat> and if you'd like to read about better, better agricultural methods, please go right ahead, which is very, very good for us. Uh, they've been very respectful and were taking great care not to damage any of Kirill's religious items as they collected them, but did... Such did little to soften the blow. He led his church and the small community around it for decades, doing his best to provide guidance and support to the simple yet pious people of the local villages. And now he was not sure if he'd ever be permitted to return. He had learned, he had heard from f other fellow priests about this happening elsewhere, churches taken over by the military, who greatly valued the bell be be towers for observation and sellers for protection. More than once, more than one had been destroyed by the enemy if and when the fighting had returned. Still more though, still... Though still left standing, they returned to their once shepherds in terrible condition. He hoped dearly that this would not be the case for them. As the soldiers finished packing and carefully stacking boxes beside the doorway, Kirill took one last look around the now empty nave and realized how much larger it seemed when bereft of fixtures. Then he picked up the boxes, carried them to the cart that one of the local farmers had insisted he used for travel and departed. And as the bell tower of the church disappeared over the horizon, he could not stifle his tears. A necessary sacrifice? Maybe. Maybe. Maybe it's necessary. Maybe it's not. Big sadness for the man. The Indonesian Wars. We prefer independence with poverty to servitude with plenty. The Pacific alight. Good luck, guys. You're definitely going to need it for free in Indonesia. Holy cow. Anything else? Nope. The king of the people. And then we'll do install regional stuff. And we have about a month left. Roughly a month for two of these taxes. So it's not too bad. Oh, come on. Keep building, guys. Keep building, 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 building. And we're slowly approaching. 1966. Uh, what is our resource extraction game right now? We need a little bit more rubber. We're doing okay on tungsten. Oh, it was tungsten, not aluminum. All right, we have a little bit of fuel, fuel as well. It's not bad. Not bad at all. Really not bad. We have a core population of about 215,000. Oh, no, 10 million, I mean. A non-core population of 215,000. And we're still mobilizing a little bit more, which is not bad. We could really use some tanks, though. Tanks would be quite nice. Cool. The people share. Which we'll read very, very soon. Anything else here? Ooh, no. Okay. It was always a good day, the delicates thought, when King Rurik was in attendance at the meeting of the Semsky Sobor, primarily because it meant a decision would most likely be made, and there would not be simply an internal argument between his children. Today, they quickly found themselves to be at least half correct. Rurik, after opening the session and thanking all those there, announced the immediate imposition of a number of welfare-based reforms upon the state as recommended by Prince Yuri. Although Yuri was quick to stand and thank the king for the foresight he so clearly possessed, <clears throat> Uh, little attention was paid to him, for all eyes were upon Princess Lydia, who, as her father's announcement had progressed, had become increasingly still, a motion they had learned was always followed by eruption. An eruption that soon followed as her voice echoed through the chamber. The very concept was inexcusable, and she cried, and even by recommending it to her father in the first place, Yuri had failed in his duties. The challenges facing the state were immense. She continued passionately, and their resources were highly limited. Diverting those to social endeavors instead of military or other social security forces was not only short-sighted, it was, according to her, borderline criminal. After a short while, and during a pause, Yuri calmed, calmly asked her sister if she was finished. As she stared back at him, wide-eyed, he turned to King Rurik, who, openly, who only nodded as he looked to, at his daughter. And that was that. Lydia sunk back into her chair, defeated for now, but the look of the fury in her eyes was not unmistakable, and all knew that this decision was not, could not be the end. Oh boy. Could another, any other response have been expected? Hey, more stability, even though people are yelling at each other all the times. Hey, oh, that sucks for Samara, but they're gone and promotes Loya Bogyars, and the WRF has united the far part of the Western nation for Russia, so we'll have to kill them later on. Probably. Princess Lydia understands the many opportunities within the Ministry of Internal Affairs, namely, the lack of support held by the aristocracy among the rural populations by appointing certain boyars or prominent nobles who had exemplified allegiance to Lydia. The ministry shall serve as a tool for silencing democratic elements and further cementing the princess's power. Complaints about abuses of power and corruption well without a doubt flood the ministry. However, the bureaucracy will be rendered inefficient by them and forced to rely on a less pleasant means of controlling the new prince provinces. Finally, Prince Yuri will protest this blatant attack on his support base, but let him shout. The ministry will all but assure Lydia's power. Greatly increase the influence of Lydia's power and get more despotism. Cool. And we're about less than a week for more stuff. Um, what can we do with more, more peepee here? I'd like to do more stuff, please. Uh, screw it. Oh, we can still do this one, I guess. It hurts your civvies, but... Infrastructure is always nice to get. And we're not going to be building infrastructure for a while. Let's take a look at this. Wow. It's not going up by an extreme amount. 
but it's still going up, which is still very nice. Poverty, slowly getting better. Industrial equipment looking not too bad. Civil construction, industrial expertise, very good. Army professionalism is going up by four months. I like that a lot. I really do. I guess this one next. Why not? Five days left, and then promote loyal Bo boyars. Loyal boyars. Nice. Meet your new owner. A uh, Pozenik Dmitry Guryav well, had been out of, looking out of the window of his new office with feelings of trepidation. He had been rather excited about his election to the position, but when he arrived at the small town in the eastern reaches of the realm, it was he surprised at the hostility he faced. The town spoke he had, had been distant and cold at best. As his car drove down the main street to his new residence, he had been subjected to ridicule from the residents. They had thrown mud and dung at the windows, his manhood was questioned, and his guards were forced to step in when a former Black Army militiaman had thrown himself at the car with a knife in hand. He knew he had to work, his work cut out for him. The people in the region had grown so used to the freedom given to him by the Black Army that it would, be take, it would take much to gain even the smallest amount of respect from them. They shaped under new taxes and other obligations to the kingdom that they found themselves a part of. He knew most of their discontent was idle bluster, but even then he realized the sheer importance of stability and contentness would bring. For the time being, he would have to put up with the heckling as he went about his day and to find ways to endear himself and the kingdom to the people he now served. Dimitri turned back to his work and glared silently as the tax papers or the papers in front of him. There had been some issues with the tax numbers his past month. He still hoped to do his duty to the best of his abilities, and he also hoped that the people he oversaw would come to respect him and the new government in the future. The burden of leadership is quite a heavy thing, and that is absolutely true. Leadership has such high costs. Incredibly high costs, which is quite unfortunate for, you know, people in leadership positions. But, you know what? Sometimes that's okay. Those costs have to be bared. I'm, I'm tempted just to do these. Okay, why not? We could use more stability, right? Or, or some more stability. More uh, war support. Because why not? Oh, yes. Keep building, my friends. Keep building. We love the building. Uh, I think it's just my mind. Things just feel laggy to me, maybe? Probably. I'm going crazy. Assemble new Vesh. King Rurik has decreed the creation of new Vesh, or council. Unlike the Zemsky Sobor and his ministries, the Vesh ad serves advisory roles, including war planning, building layouts, and will help with political maneuvering around other factions. The Vesh will consist of those who have proven their worth to the Tsar in the past, and hopefully, those whose allegiance is to Rurik rather than his bickering heirs. The Vesh will meet, will, will meet off-record in undisclosed locations, and therefore have no legal power, but, haha, <laughs> due to his constitution will be one of the most influential organizations in the young, young kingdom. Our industrial equipment begins to improve, and we get more stability. What's not to love? What's not to love? 4.7? Oh, or 1.7. Oh, no, point, 4.7. Cool. Come on, guys. Can you just kill each other off, please? Happy 1966, though, everyone. Hope you're having a great, great year. We're doing quite well ourselves. And we have some more 40 coming with infantry. No wonder our debt keeps going up, or annual deficit. We keep getting more divisions. Hey, we're not making only 40 combo with infantry, which is great, because I'm ready to bust the crap out of everyone who opposes us. Oh, liberals unified Kazakhstan? He looks pretty happy. Congratulations. Let's give that motorized, which actually we need to make that 40 combo with as well, probably. Thank you. New Vesh, thank you. And now we're probably out of more guns, way out of guns, and anti-tank, but that's okay. Uh, for now, cut down on what we're making. You can go down to one. You can go down to one for now. That's totally fine with me. Ah, sanity slippage. The newly appointed mayor Magadan watches a grand slight approach to him carrying Ring King Rick II. This was a special occasion, and so the mayor had his entire staff dress up in the most formal clothing they could afford. The sled came to a stop, and King Rurik now stood before him on an ornate sword in hand. An ornate sword in hand. The mayor knelt before him and pledged his eternal loyalty to the Tsar. The king in a booming voice declared the mayor Lord of Magadan and declared Valentin Zvezkov that he, the head of the new noble house. Following his ascension to the nobility, Svetskov was granted his official coat of arms and a ceremonial sword in celebration of the event. Several Rurik's retainers participated in a somewhat impromptu jousting tournament located upon Magadan's largest street. Several more hours of entertainment followed until it was time for the small private dinner for the king had sets off prepared. The dinner was fairly quiet, and the two men discussing the more mundane aspects of Valentin's duties. They discussed things like army recruitment quotas, tax policies, Magadan's port, overseas trade, and the hypothetical revival of Russia's Pacific fleet. Throughout the dinner, however, the king seemed distracted as if something was deeply bothering him. As they were finishing their meal, the Tsar let out a deep, depressed sigh. Sevskov was too nervous to, to directly ask what was bothering the monarch and said suddenly wondered if his hospitality had been unsatisfactory. As he was about to speak up, the deafening silence of the room was broken by the arrival of several servants, accompanied by the guests. Svetskov dismissed his words and stood up to greet the new arrivals. We hope you enjoyed the visit to Magadan, Your Majesty. I don't know why that one... We're not... We don't control Magadan right now. I mean, if you want to give it to me or give it to us, that'd be great. But we don't own it, so... Okay. 
will go along with it, I suppose, and render under Rurik. Rurik, King Rurik, recognizes the struggles faced by the peasantry, but the coffers need gold. A revived tax code needs to be drafted, mints established, but ultimately the foundations of the kingdom will come from the common man's pocket, after all. Was it not Rurik who would save the Russian people from the treacherous anarchists and vile despots? All of Russia belongs to the Tsar. Every pound of gold must be accounted for. Russia must not be allowed to lag behind the rest of the world any longer. However, Rurik is a benevolent ruler, so taxes will be very based on location and circumstance. Individual enterprises must not be compromised. The new tax code understands the plight of the peasantry. So we lose political power, stability, construction speed, factory output, and dockyard output in exchange for way more money. Wow, 50% income tax rate. And we get more daily political power, lose even more stability, and get more income tax rate because we can. I love it. More output? Yes, please. We definitely need that right now. Oh, nothing. Something else? Oh, we don't. The royal court. Uh, output is not bad. Oh, we could use that, really. But she's already so high up, so whatever. Keep training, guys. 22 divisions is not enough. How many divisions does ma men have? Not man, but men. He has no manpower, too. They both have no manpower. Oh, no. Urkus actually has manpower. They might still win. He has up to 9, and Urkutsk has up to 10. Obviously, not very much. I love Novosibirsk. Oh, man. Oh, my goodness. We really have nothing else down here to do. Oh, come on. Give me more, thi give me more things to improve society. I just want to improve society, man. Oh, and soon enough we'll get rid of this so we'll have more consumer goods. Not really, but more construction speed, which would be just great. Just super bueno. Render under the king. Beautiful. And the next one will be done in quite a few days, so that's okay. Any other decisions? Please give me more decisions. The Clash of Wolves, though. The inevitable has occurred. Prince Yuri and Princess Lydia have been fighting each other for years now, competing to see who would first be chosen as heir for the throne, who would be given the chance to shape the future of Russia, and who would be left to play as second fiddle. For the past two few weeks, fanatic supporters of both sides have clashed in the streets of Kemerovo, while politicians and nobles fight in the civil war. King Rurik II has noticed the devastation that comes with this robber and fears that the situation may deteriorate into civil war. Thus, the king has decided to finally name a successor. The entire kingdom watches silently, and even outside forces are curious to see the winner, the next ruler of all of the Rus. The king's ear, my friends. Rurik sat at an ornate ooh, round table with his hands folded atop it. Around him were some of the most powerful and influential men in the kingdom, conspicuously excluding the two wolves. I thank you for coming, gentlemen, to the first meeting of the newly assembled Vesh. It is my hope that this council will provide tactful and wise advice to the rulers of the Rus. Perhaps for the first session we should discuss a growing <clears throat> discord, like my server. After a brief silence, Pitor Baranovsky was the first to speak. It's obvious that what's causing all this discord is those two children of yours constantly butting heads whenever they meet. You want to s save the realm from splitting apart? Something must be done about them. What would you suggest we do? Their influence grows by the day, and they've already rallied against two very different sections of the populace to the cause. I believe we should just nominate a successor and ride out the storm as best we can, chimed in Boris Krylov, the only other member of the royal family present. Rurik gave his son's words at some thought. He was hesitant to nominate a successor, but it was becoming apparent that it, if it wasn't done soon, the kingdom's stability could be in jeopardy. The only issue, however, was deciding which one would eventually take the crown. Whatever is decided, someone will not be happy. Wow, what under manpower? Whoa, what? Really? What happened? what happened to our manpower? Why did it just all go bye-bye? We have 10 million people here, but holy crap, what happened to it? Um, if that's the case, I don't mind cutting this down a little bit. Because we technically we do have descent down here still, which really, really sucks. Compound is not too bad. I wish we could core Western Mongolia. Like, I would really love to be able to. But we're not able to, which sucks. Actually, are we still... Hold on. Occupy territories. Oh, I don't like police force. Because it helps lower compliance, but we don't want to help lower compliance. We want to get as much compliance as fast as possible. Yes, poverty relief. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Slightly more manpower, which would be nice. Oh, and the tax rate. Actually, so we currently get... Ooh, 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 boy. 12.55 expenditures. Income is... Where? 9.7%. Annual revenue is 7.1. Oh, boy. Well, let's go into the Clash of the Wolves. Anything else here? Nope. And look at this. Okay, a slightly higher deficit. It's now 7.2, which isn't that much more, so it is what it is. We currently get how much? 1.65, my goodness. The people share. It was always a good day, the delicate slot, when King Rurik was in attendance at the meeting in the Zemsky Sabor. Primarily because it meant a decision would most likely be made, and there would not be simply an eternal argument between his children. Today, they quickly found themselves to be at least half correct. Uh, uh, did I already read this one? Uh, yeah, I already read them. The people share. Yeah, I already read this one. Welfare-based reforms upon the state is recommended by Frontier. I already read this one. So if you'd like to read about this one again, second time in this episode, 
Please go right ahead. Let's hope this all blows over soon because Lydia was crying. She sunk back down into her chair, defeated for now. But look at the fury in her eyes. was unmistakable. And all knew that the decision was... Oh, boy. Well, that's not good. Oh, God. Yeah, this that episode is more laggy than normal, but... All knew the decision was not, could not be the end. It is what it is, you know? It is what it is. Clash of the Walls and the Spirit of the Rust Reborn. Find the political climate and Siberia has been stabilized. King's Guard units no longer skirmish at Yuri's supporters in the streets, and the nobles are finally beginning to see eye to eye. A general census has concluded that the workers are content and forecast no longer second revolution. Or no second revolution. King Rukh II has already summoned Zemsky subordinate to determine the next course of action. To the east and west lies uh, more pretenders, selfish dictators who cling to a failed past. The new Rust will strike outwards, confident in security and stability. The spill. Die, you fascist pigs. All you communist scum should go to heck. Those hostile shouts, countless and countless others, could be heard from two crowds facing each other. One unionist, one reactionary. Placard hit banners. Hit banner as they both came together, not in unity or solidarity, but out of hatred and resentment. As the shouts of the crowds increased in amount and fury, the police standing guard looking at each other nervously. Much as they preferred not to intervene, they were being left with little choice. With one of them being sent to get back up, the rest of the officers stood up with grim determination, ready to step in and put a stop to things if necessary. Fortunately for them, backup j arrived just in time, having their numbers doubled and already being ready to go on short notice by Rurik's own orders. As the reinforced officers already already on scene, the confrontation before them began to turn violent, with punches being landed and signs being thrown. At the sound of the whistle, the police descended upon a group on the two crowds. As a group on the two crowds, after dealing with minor resistance, they both dispersed both, even with the current clash taken care of. Each officer thought the same thing. Things cannot keep going on like this. Yep, it is what it is. Hire four instructors, you bet we will, because what else are we going to spend our PP on? We have so much stability, or we have so much war support, we actually have a little bit of manpower left, too. The Black Wolf. It is my privilege as emperor and autocrat of all of the Rus to name my daughter Lydia as crown princess. In the event of my passing, she shall become your rightful sovereign. Overwhelming applause followed the king's proclamation about almost instantaneously. The newly appointed crown princess and heir to the throne, Lydia, rose from her seat to address Zemsky Sabor. As... She stood before the entire council, silence had once again dominated the chamber. From the bottom of my heart, I thank you all for this great responsibility that you bestowed upon me, Father. You will not find a more soul capable of continuing your glorious legacy as I. Know that I will focus all my efforts on continuing to bring strength and honor to the realm. I will not rest until the darkness that has befallen the roost has been banished through sheer force of will. Lydia's brief speech was punctuated by bolsterous return of the applause. As she surveyed the celebrations, Lydia felt more proud in the moment than any other in her entire life. Victory at last. Her wandering eyes eventually landed on her brother, Prince Yuri, who had conspicuously abstained from joining in on the applause. As her eyes had met, Lydia shot him a smug grin. Yuri's disconnected demeanor quickly turned to that of a smoldering anger, and the snub prince quickly got up from his seat and made for the chamber's exit. Yuri angrily slammed the door behind him, and the noise startling some of the council members. As her brother departed, Lydia's smirk disappeared. She had secured a prize she had so desperately coveted, but was it really worth making an enemy of her own brother? Even now, the crown princess was not entirely sure. All hell, crown princess Lydia. Oh boy, we lose. Oh boy, we lose stuff. Adds back room backstabber. Well, that's not good. But you know what? That'd be kind of cool in Tino too if this ever happens. Like, if Lydia or even other, you know, Prince Yuri gets crowned, would the other one try to, like, flee to Germany and try to, you know, start rebellions in the Grand Principality of Central Siberia? That'd be kind of cool. I think that'd be really, really awesome, actually. But maybe that's just me. The foundations of the kingdom. Internal politics have to be stabilized. Work programs sound pretty good. Build up Pulharan's plan. Oh, uh, we have still comments to go through. Oh, yeah. Increase your because Such as, uh,. We don't simp for Lydia here. We simp for Bukharina. I need to play as Comey again. I play as Bukharina sometime. So. Diplomacy. Overtures to Washington. Um, oh, learning from these guys. Bonus for, there's the bonus for land doctrine. Ar rapidly improve. Uh, let me do Army of the Roots. With the new principality should come a new army. Although it's proven its superiority over our foes during the unification of such a superior, our military is still woefully outdated in its nearly every aspect. The way it's organized down to the equipment and our soldiers are to use. Before we can con seriously consider any kind of plan to reunify the nation, our military needs to be brought up to modern standards. This process will be long and not exactly easy, but a fully modernized military should be the envy of the king's many foes and make reconquest all the more simple. And let's see. Yeah, cool. A quiet moment. Rook stood by his bedroom window, beginning to look over the city of Novosibirsk. I'm glad they got that one right. The sun was beginning to set. Uh, the sky a blend of soft orange and blue as the sun began to sink below the horizon. The rock reflected upon his rule. From the pits of despair, he had given Russia hope, bringing light to a country adrift in darkness. His rule had not been peaceful, and it had not been perfect, but he had achieved a great deal.
The sun was halfway below the horizon, the orange sky turning to red, the red facing to purple, or fading to purple. The first stars began to shine down from the heavens, outnumbered by the lights of the city below. The king, king grew weaker with every passing day, and now he needed a cane to move over his palace, to move about his palace. Rurik knew that he would not live to see Moscow free from the Germans who enslaved his people. He would have to leave that duty to his successor, his heir, Princess Lydia. He knew that they could succeed. He believed. He believed he had prepared them well. His child would lead this, this kingdom to greatness and avenge the humiliation of the motherland he had been put through. Or the... the... Humiliation the motherland had been put through. Nikolai Krylov chuckled, knowing that his children and the rest of the nation were so attached to the Uruk ideals, and the mask he had eventually become. The sun was now below the horizon. The king of the night had fallen over the motherland once more, and King Uruk turned away from the window and returned to his desk, for the king still had much work to do. Only in darkness can you see the stars. Very nice. Don't kill him off yet, game. Please, mod. Please, dad. Do not kill off our king. He is too good to us. God, we just... So much pee pee. We gotta spend our pee pee. We're not building fast enough. We're still... I, I don't know. I just... It just feels off. Urkusk might still win. We might have a good old communist to kill off here, which I still need to play as these guys. Sounds like a lot of fun, but... Playing as a Far East is never easy. Never easy. Alright, so maybe we'll edit you guys in the meantime. Um, Artillery, 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 artillery. And we get some truckies here, too. Nice. Let's make this look kind of nice like this. Thank you. Oh, crap. That's not going to look nice now. Uh, oh, that's all we can have. Ah, 38 is good enough for now. If I remember, we'll come back to that. We need more... Oh! We need more uh, army XP. Oh, man. I thought Urkut had won. Darn it. Army of the Rus. A meritocratic system. In decades past, officers got the command based on the significance of the background, whether it was the noble blood, wealth, and ethnicity, or loyalty to the party. Such foolishness was once one of the many factors that caused the humiliation of the Russian Empire in the First World War and then the Soviet Union in the Second World War. We cannot afford to repeat the mistakes of the past, for so to do so would surely invite disaster as it has many times before. In King Rurik's newly reformed military, advancement will come from merit alone. Our officers will have to prove themselves to be capable leaders on the field of battle, and only then will they be given the privilege of a promotion. With the aid of battle-hardened, experienced officers together, the troops, our armies will undoubtedly march from victory to victory. The Royal Inspection. The men stood in rigid rows. The uniforms clean, their rifles resting in their arms. General Ivan Yakolev's men were clearly attempting to make the best impressions possible. Oh, my apologies. Uh, King Yarkovlev walked down the rows, discussing the state of the army to King Rurik. Back down when you were when, back when you were first donned the crown, Your Majesty. These men couldn't even line up straight. Now look at them, disciplined and clean, and some of the finest men east of the Urals. Yokolev's words had some merit, with Rurik having seen just the men perform a training exercise. They performed admirably. A far cry from the ragtag, desperate men Rurik had left after Andrei's betrayal, of course. There was still room for improvement. The equipment they carried was still outdated, albeit some progress there had been made in the last couple of months. Rurik brought up these concerns, amongst others, and Yokolev, uh... Largely agreed. Yes, the situation regarding equipment and uniforms is less than desired, and the men can lose morale easier than I like, but I'd say that we've improved greatly, Your Majesty. If we ignore the issue of equipment, which in my hands are tied, how does Your Majesty feel about the state of your army? They seem more disciplined. You've done a lot of good work here, Yakolov. With our eyes upon, set upon seizing the eastern shores of the motherland, I hope you can continue to show such excellent results. I will try my best, Your Majesty. The finest soldiers in all the Rus, and I ask, and we shall get some more army XP, which is great. Logistics might be necessary. Are we still making... We're not making anything yet, Yet are we? No, we're not. Darn, it sucks. Uh, eh, we don't need you anymore. We don't need you anymore. 40 combo with all the way, man. All the way. How many tanks do we have? 18, so that's not enough. Okay. Uh, next technology will be done in about three weeks. Uh, royal pardons. Leader experience gain. Uh, shield maidens. Combat rolls. Expel the shield maidens. That's not bad. The king's, the king's finest. What are the foundations of a kingdom next? Because we want to improve our economy and society. The once thriving heart of Russian industry is now under the watchful eye of Rurik II, but the sad truth is that the heart no longer beats. Years of strife and warlord conflict render vast swaths of the region in shambles, and many of the factories are in too poor a condition to be of any use to us. This is to change and quickly. It will take a great deal of sweat and toil, but the industry of central Siberia will come back online one way or another. Once this arduous task has been completed, our kingdom will have in its grasp a weapon more powerful than any other gun or tank in the world. An industrial backbone with no equal. Import heavy machinery? You bet we're going to do that immediately. Absolutely immediately. We have so much stability. It's too easy playing as this nation. It's really just too easy. Great. The foundations of a kingdom. Beautiful, my friends. And 
work programs, which we saw a new currency, might not be bad. Let's do that one. Ever since the fall of the Soviet Union, the ruble has been increasingly irrelevant to the point of being worth less than toilet paper. Oh boy, wipe, wipe, wipe. Foreign currencies have begun to grow in popularity in various regions across Russia, and in particularly disparate places, the locals have resorted to a primitive barter economy. In His Majesty's realm, this farce will not be allowed to continue. The Royal Ministry of Finance has proposed a radical new idea to help build the kingdom's economy into something resembling functionality. They wish to introduce a new currency known as the Grivna, in all territories currently controlled by the Rurik II, with the hope that it will be able to stem the tide of foreign currencies worming their way into Russian society. The Grivna, pitched as a new currency, for a new Russia. Seems like a solid idea worth considering. Very cool. Keep going with factories. We need the factories done, and then we're going to massively try to improve um, our, our capabilities to wage war. So, new currency will be next. Uh, Royal University Charters, which would be very, very good to get. Siberian Wealth is nice to get. The, to no, to no, 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 no. the Knowledge of Tomsk and reestablish trade routes. Ooh, base bleed. Yes. Make our enemies bleed as much as possible. Yes, 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 yes. A thousand times yes. We're running out of manpower, which is not good, though. Do the free aviators... Oh, Tom Omsk. Omsk is doing quite well. Oh, the free aviators do not have any focus tree, which kind of sucks. That really sucks. I want to play some sometime, but I guess not yet. Maybe it's a, if they get content someday. We need more manpower. We're not even making divisions yet. Go ahead and go some, do some medium upgrades since we're running out of things for you to do. That's fine. Foundations of a kingdom. Oh, we do that too. It's over there. Let's well, armor improvements. Bonus blueprints are nice and all, but they're not extremely necessary right now. Oh, it's not bad. Two more military factories and Rook's Triumph. Not bad. New country is more important for me, though. And maybe we'll read one more focus and then we'll end it and call it an episode. And preserving the past, building the, rebuilding the future. Rook... King Rurik II paced slowly alongside the large-scale model of the newly proposed renovations of Novosibirsk, making sure to soak in every detail. For far too long, he'd been forced to hold court in the frozen remnants of a proper city. Should the vision depicted within the model before him realize, Novosibirsk would shine once more as the center of power that it was fit for a monarch of King Rurik II's stature. Foreign Minister and Royal Architect Pyotr Baranovsky stood in the corner of the room, looking on his liege, on as his liege, uh, gleefully examined the model he put together. Rurik II was usually a gloomy old fellow, but today his eyes betrayed the excitement of a child in a candy store. I trust everything is to your liking, Your Grace. Masterful work as always. Baranovsky, fle fleeting visions of Russia's past transplanted into the present. Rurik II's gaze remained focused on the model as he spoke, and he leaned in for a closer look. The proposed buildings were not unlike the kingdom itself, taking up clear inspiration from the architectural legacy of medieval Russia, mirrored with a sensible modern touch. With all the red and white crowned with a variety of garnish decorated roofs, the structures of the hypothesized city were a feast for his eyes. Rurik finally managed to peel his attention away from the model and expected towards architect. Marvelous, simply marvelous. One can expect the renovations to begin, Baranovsky. As soon as we are able to, Your Grace, we just require you will have it. Whatever it is, it shall be yours so long as this masterpiece becomes reality. Building a mighty legacy one brick at a time, like a Lego set. Beautiful. We really could use more manpower. Uh, and then, let's see, yes, build up Bukharin's plan. For all of his faults, not everything Nikolai Bukharin did was inherently bad. For one, his Siberian plan transformed Siberia from a des desolate backwater to a formidable industrial powerhouse. The effects of this plan can still be felt to, the very, to this very day, and is the reason why the potential of our industry is so immense. The years, unfortunately, have not been kind to Siberia. Although the infrastructure established in Bukharin's day is still mostly operational, it has seen much better days. Rurik II wishes to reverse this decay and to that... And to that end, a new expanded Siberian plan will begin. Should this plan succeed, the kingdom's influence or industrial strength will soar to the glorious new heights. And since we're here, we might as well go ahead and read worker programs. The years of fighting across Central Siberia is brutal and heavy, heavily destructive, and many towns have been reduced to not much more than smoldering ruins. Even months after the fighting, much of the damage from the wars has yet to be repaired. Thousands are without homes and without work, and the situation could only grow out of control if nothing is done. Our king, ever considerate of his people's woes, has a solution to kill two birds with one stone. A specialized work program will be created by the task of repairing any and all damage caused by the fighting that's gone without repairs. The towns and villages of central Siberia will be returned to their former glory, and in the process we will provide thousands of people with steady jobs to put, on, to put food on their tables. But, I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below if you haven't already, which by the time I'm sure you already have, whether you want to or not. And I'll see you tomorrow, when we will hopefully reunify all the Far East under us, and continue pushing forward, and making Russia whole and great again. Thanks for watching, and have a tremendous rest of your day.